Welcome once again to A Look Ahead. We are taking a look in advance of the Sabbath School lessons for the first quarter of 2012. In this series entitled Glimpses of Our God, we are ready for lesson number four for January 28 of 2012. We would like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin our study together. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study and learn more about you. And now as we consider judgment and what all that implies and grace and what that implies, may we understand you more clearly as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this lesson focuses on God's judgment, God's grace or graciousness, and how the two are related. God's judgment scares a lot of people. The church has used scare tactics for generations to try to force people to do what they want them to do. This has become such a pervasive influence that in the 19th century, people dreamed up ways to eliminate God from their thinking so they would not have to face his judgment. Atheism, skepticism, higher criticism, and evolution are attempts in various ways to escape the judgment of God. So this ought to give us a clue about how important this lesson is. However, despite all those attempts, we still have the words of Scripture, first found in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, where it says, After all this, there's only one thing to say. Have reverence for God, respect for God, and obey His commands, because this is all that human beings were created for. Now, we might argue about that, but it goes on to say, God is going to judge everything we do, whether good or bad, even things done in secret. And Revelation 20, verses 12 and 13, talks about God actually doing that judgment clear at the end. And I saw the dead, great and small alike, standing before the throne. Books were opened, and then another book was opened, the book of, of the living. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. Then the sea gave up its dead. Death and the world of the dead also gave up the dead they held. And all were judged according to what they had done. Does that sound like everybody gets to participate in the judgment? Sure does, doesn't it? So when will this judgment take place? Well, it seems like it might be spread out at different times for okay. different people. Okay. Is there more than one judgment? And how many of us will be judged? What is the relationship between judgment and grace? What are the criteria for the judgment? How does God decide who is going to be saved and who is not? We need to remember, as we're talking about these criteria, we need to remember that Jesus promised the thief on the cross that he would be there. You remember Luke 23, 43. Maybe we should read that. Jesus said to him, I promise you that today, I promise you today, we would say, you will be with me in paradise. So... The thief on the cross apparently is going to be there. What kind of standard could we establish that would allow him in without opening the door to everyone, as some believe will happen? So I, I've just read you the verses that says we're all judged based on what we do, right? Old Testament verses, New Testament verses. Here's the thief. He's nailed on the cross. He says... Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, fine, that's all it takes. What did he, what did he do? But, but see how much faith that thief exercised. What does he have to lose? He could see, I mean, his statement expresses the belief that this is the Messiah, that he will come into his kingdom in spite of this death. Mm -hmm. Now, the disciples, they all ran to hiding. <laughs> they didn't have that kind of faith. They weren't nailed to a cross. Well, I... I it, <laughs> he would have run too if he had a chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so well, there was... I recently heard a sermon by a... Uh, a woman who, who is, is quite articulate and based on that verse. Okay. And that is that we can know 
that we have it in our, that we will be saved. And, uh, you know, I wrote a letter to, to a friend of mine about that. And I said, you know, she takes this verse and then rips it out of context with both hands. Mm -hmm. The context being that the thief has been crucified. Mm -hmm. He will die within hours. He is staring deeply into the abyss and he knows that his probation is at an end. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not our situation at this moment. That requires some serious thinking, huh? I guess so. Well, 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 well what's the purpose of judgment? Um, when I was a kid, I used to think that, um, okay, God's there and he has this, this kind of this blackboard right here and he goes through, you, through the book, seeing what you're doing and marking down all the bad things and marking down all the good things. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, you add them all up and whatever comes up, that's, that's what happens. So is that good, what judgment good, is about? The good things make up for the bad things, right? Well, yeah. I mean, there's a there's kind of a <laughs> a lot of people have an idea like that. Yeah, I mean, it's just like Very weighing sure, right yeah. there. Mm -hmm. And so, is is that the purpose of judgment? Well, before before we get to that point, there's another thing we need to recognize. Adventists don't have any problem with this idea of a judgment. We'll we'll come to the details of that later. But many of our Christian friends, they're not quite sure how to deal with this judgment thing because. In their opinion, everyone gets judged at the time when he dies. You either go to heaven or you go to hell, or if you're Roman Catholic, maybe you spend a little time in purgatory before you go to heaven. Okay? So, there, there's not a time when we all gather together at the end and are judged. People have already gone to their reward. Now, they have this approach because they believe in the immortality of the soul. That's an ancient Greek idea not a Christian idea, not a Hebrew idea, not a biblical idea, but it somehow filtered its way into Christian thinking. I think the Bible had the first idea of it, though. Right? You mean Satan's, the, Satan's statement back at the beginning? Right. Yeah, right. well, straight from Satan, sure. Now, to Seventh-day Adventists who believe in the mortality of the soul, it is natural for there to be a pre-Advent judgment. So if, Paul, if God's going to come down, he's getting ready to take the righteous and take them to heaven and leave the wicked here to either dead or to die, then he has to decide who he's going to take, right? So that seems per perfectly natural to us, but to our friends who think that good or, the good people are already in heaven and the bad people are already in hell, this doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, so how can there be a pre-advent judgment? How, and how does God's judgment work? I guess that's the next question, and this is what you were talking about. Look at John 3, 17 to 21. This is a very clear passage about God's judgment. John 3, and by the way, just to expand a little bit, this follows immediately after the most famous verse of all, John 3, 16. So let me start with that. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its Savior. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. Now, this ought to be as clear as it can be, right? The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil evil. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. So the question I would raise in light of all that, do we judge ourselves? It sounds like it, doesn't it? Well, if we deplore God, things that are moral, uh, then we run to the darkness. Mm -hmm. that's, that's behavior on our part. Mm -hmm. if, if, if we uh, believe in our fellow men, uh, in, in their uh, goodness, that they are children of God, and we uh, 
endeavor to improve their lives and our lives, uh, could that not be described as, as running to the light? Yeah. Well, let's, I, I'm trying to fill out the picture of what goes on in this judgment. Look at Daniel 7, 9 and 10. This is a little bit, this should give us a clue about the judgment. Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10. While I was looking, this is Daniel in vision, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever, now who would that be? It has to be God, right? Sat down on one of the thrones. His clothes were white as snow and his hair was like pure wool. His throne, mounted on fiery wheels, was blazing with fire. And a stream of fire was pouring out from it. Okay, that's God seated on his throne. There were many thousands of people there to serve him and millions of people stood before him. The court began its session and the books were open. So, and I want to read one other passage and then I have a question for you. Look at Revelation 20 verse 4. Then I saw thrones and those who sat on them were given the power to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been executed because they had proclaimed the truth that Jesus revealed and the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image, nor had they received the mark of the beast on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and ruled as kings with Christ for a thousand years. Now this is the millennium period and so forth. So now I come back and I ask this question. Some have suggested that perhaps there's more than one judgment. Um, do you think you could write out a, a fair criteria, set of criteria for the heavenly committee to go by? Well, there's some people I hope they don't. <laughs> <laughs> you mean those the ones that are your enemies? Or? <laughs> well, some people have funny ideas. I'm just glad they're not the ones. Well, let me, let me just nail this down if I can. Is God independently making these decisions or does, are there other people involved, other beings involved? Because well, this is a major not, issue. Well, does God... <laughs> Does God have to go through a process of judgment? I mean, doesn't he know? It's, it's the other people that don't know. Mm -hmm. And don't they have to <clears throat> go through that process to have everybody agree with God's pronouncement on somebody? Who's the jury here? Yeah, is there a jury? Who's the accuser? You know, um, this sounds to me like God is the one who is being accused. Mm -hmm. that Satan is accusing God that the, this throne of people, they are the ones watching how God has dealt with uh, the people down here on this earth, mm -hmm. that uh, we're not the ones that are really being looked at, but God is. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, there's a verse, some verses in the Bible that sound a little bit like that. Look at Romans 3. And I will start from verse 3. But what if some of them, talking about the Jews in the Old Testament times, what if some, some of them were not faithful? Does this mean that God will not be faithful? Certainly not. God must, must be true, even though every human being is a liar. As the scripture says, you, talking about God, you must be shown to be right when you speak. You must win your case when you are being tried. Who's being tried? God. <clears throat> Yeah, but he's got to be shown to be right, too. Uh -huh. So how do you show him to be right unless you're looking towards the thing that he's talking about? Well, my question, yeah, fair enough. My question is, who's, who's going to decide whether God's right? Does God ever take his case and ask the other beings of some kind to judge him? Well, God, oh, God knows that he's right. It's... These so people there's, there's you're talking no, about are the ones that have question, right? Okay, and who is that? Everyone else, Everyone. especially <laughs> after the the war. Uh huh. And three twenty-five and twenty-six, God demonstrated says three times basically that He demonstrated that God is always right. Do we have a little bit of glimpse of a judgment going on in the story of Job? Mm -hmm. when, when Satan says, if you, if you take all the good things away from him and let me at him, he'll be mine. And God is saying, no, 
he'll be mine. Mm -hmm. So now our names are coming up one by one, mm -hmm. and God is saying they are safe to save because I know the deeds and thoughts of their heart, their motive. Um, I know what was going on behind what you see just written mm -hmm. on the book. Mm -hmm. And yes, they are, or no, they're not. It looks like Job is kind of a pretest, and w w our judgment is kind of a post test. Okay. <laughs> okay. It just well just observe that. Seventh day Adventists have a couple of fairly unique doctrines. One of them we'll, we'll talk about another one of them in a moment, but one of them is called the the idea of an investigative judgment. Now. We have gotten, I think we've gotten wise in recent years, and we're, we're, we're changing that name investigative judgment, which sort of implies that even God is trying to figure things out, which we don't believe, to change it to a pre-advent judgment. What, what is implied by the name pre-advent judgment? Advent means coming, so mm -hmm. before the coming, God is going, before his coming, God is going to judge us. Okay. That's what's implied. Why, why would that be necessary? Are you going to be taken to heaven mm -hmm. or are you going to be left behind dead? Mm -hmm. Okay. So some kind of a decision has to be made before there's that separation, right? Either God has to make it or somebody else has to make it. Well, of course, our Christian friends don't have that issue. So. Now we're asking the question, what is the relationship between God's justice, apparently <coughs> exhibited by his choices in the, in the judgment, and his graciousness? Is there some kind of a conflict between the idea of a God of justice and the God of salvation, the God of healing? What, what do we mean when we talk about God's justice? Well, if we say the, translate that word justice as righteousness, then God is righteous. God will always do the right thing mm -hmm. under all circumstances. But the idea, unfortunately, the concept of justice has taken some sort of a hammer approach and, uh, and yet if he, God is gracious and he just won't lay the hammer on me with some love pats or something. I, yeah, I see. Yeah, I well, thought it was a barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> yes. You know, it's... Uh, um, is 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 that justice? Um, uh, some people like that like that picture of God. Uh, Barbecue in the sky by and by. Yeah, <laughs> turn the crank and uh, stoke up the propane. <laughs> uh -huh. um, that's that's. Well, for Second Peter three says it's a lot warmer than propane. The very elements will melt with fervent heat. <coughs> well, th that brings up another discussion, but we'll we'll we'll, we'll po postpone that. Okay. Yeah, but that's after the judgment, isn't it? After the, when all that it's stuff over, happens. Yes. Yeah. But we're talking about judgment right yeah. now. To find well, out when it happens. The common word for judgment in the New Testament, the Greek word, simply means, or the common word for justice, I'm sorry, it just means right. judgment. But in some places, for example, in Revelation 19.11, the word translated justice is actually the word for righteousness. So when God executes his justice, is he doing what's right? If you take a closer look, a close look at Scripture, you'll discover that much more talk about final events and the judgment in the New Testament than there is in the Old Testament. Why do you think that is? There, there's almost no talk of judgment in connection with the first coming of Christ, right? Well, there's talk about the the day of the Lord and mm -hmm. um, a number of things that make, that kind of seem to confuse the first coming and the second coming, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. or don't differentiate them, should I say. There's a lot of verses in the Bible that talk about judgment, and I've just put some of them out on the page there. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, we read already. 1 Corinthians 3, 13, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, Hebrews 10, 30, Matthew 16, 27, Revelation 20, verse 12, Revelation 22, 12, Matthew 12, 36 and 37, 1 Peter 4, 17, Revelation 6, 14, 6 and 7, just to mention a few. From these verses, 
we can conclude that everybody will be judged according to their deeds. God will reward each one according to what he has done. We will be judged not only by our deeds, but also by our words. And in our day, the hour has come for God to judge. Therefore, we are called upon to worship God. Now, here's the conundrum. Oh, go ahead, Dennis. Well, maybe I'm jumping uh, ahead of your outline here. Um, we're judged by deeds. Mm -hmm. I thought it was our faith that saved us. Well, that's what I was going to mention next. Acts 16, 31 says we are saved by faith. Well, certainly the thief on the cross that you brought up as an illustration here earlier uh, didn't have much uh, works to be judged on. Mm -hmm. So how can we be saved by faith but judged by works? Isn't it the the ones who accept Christ are not going to be judged and they're going to be saved by faith and the wicked are going to be judged because of their works. But, but why, then why does the Bible say everyone is going to be judged? Well, how else are you going to tell whether you have faith or not? You're going to have to look at their actions. You're going to have to look okay. at what they're doing. You're going to have to look at the decisions they made. That's what's going to show you whether you have faith or not. Somebody can come up and say anytime, oh, I got faith in God. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see if you really do or not. It's just like, it's just like Job, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and is it really just the acts or is it the thoughts, the motives behind it? As mm -hmm. uh, talking about the separating the sheep from the goats. If God is going to perform his judgment strictly based on what people do, bang, bang, there it is. Is there any space left for grace or graciousness? There's not one of us who could live <clears throat> a perfect life mm -hmm. that would uh, qualify us. We would all die. We would. We're all sinners. We That's all deserve right. to die. And this is, this is where th this faith comes in that if I'm doing the very best I can, like the thief on the cross, to the very best of my ability, I have faith that God will make up that difference. Okay. <coughs> if you use that ter ter I use the term well deserved to die, is that really the way it is? Or we will die if we live out of harmony? If we choose to live out of harmony, we will die? Isn't that the way the, mm -hmm. the laws of the universe really runs? Mm -hmm. It's not some, it's just the way it functions, the, the, what we call the Ten Commandments. D Dennis said earlier, if we turn the other cheek, how about if nobody was self-centered? Mm-hmm. And that's really what the Tenth Commandment is. Mm -hmm. And that causes us, because of the self center it causes us to violate or whatever, all the first nine. Well, let's look at the self-centered stuff. Okay. When you're, when you're, if you're giving yourself to somebody else, you have faith that God is going to take care of you. That's going to be one thing that's going to give you an indication that you have faith. Mm -hmm. If you're sitting there being selfish, if you just grab them, the food, the, the last bit of food that's left, you don't have faith in God that God's going to take care of you. You're going to have faith in the, the your food, have. yeah, to get it and <laughs> actually have it. So yeah. there's all kinds of things that you have to look at to see whether or not you have faith. Faith, faith actually differentiates between actions, I think. When I was a child, I, was, uh, uh, I had some teachers who, who seemed to suggest that this is the way it worked. We commit a number of sins, and every night it's our job to kneel down and pray to God and ask for forgiveness of those sins. And we're supposed to try to remember every sin we committed that day and ask for forgiveness because there's a, like a big chalkboard or a big record there somewhere. And God says, yes, he asked for forgiveness of that sin, wipe it out. I forgiveness of that sin, wipe it out. Wipe it out. So... <laughs> When judgment comes, God just looks, and if our, if our slate is clean, as if I hadn't lived a life at all, I'm saved. But if the slate's not clean, there's still some sins up there, I'm in trouble. So you get up from your knees and say, kill me now so I can make it. What if you forget one? <laughs> well, that's the question. I mean, is that possible? Well, so maybe that's not a correct view. I hope not. No, isn't it, when you, when you get the faith of Jesus, Christ, you're not going to be the perfect person all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no way. Mm -hmm. How are you going to... So that isn't the solution right there. It's, it's putting your trust in Him 
that's what the solution is. And with time, there may be some difference happening. I hope there's some difference happening. So what you're saying is that God looks at all my deeds, because we've already said the judgment is based on our deeds. He looks at all our deeds and says, well, this guy's a pretty good guy. I'm going to forgive 25%. No, I look on, look on these deeds to find out whether or not the faith is actually taking hold or not. Oh, I see. That's what it's for. No, I don't think you do see. <laughs> no, I, I, I follow you. <laughs> well, Martin Luther is, is credited with, with, with a quote uh, one of his, his books, um, talking about faith and works. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, thought, I thought Luther leaned towards uh, faith and faith alone. Mm -hmm. But he likens uh, faith and works uh, that it is impossible to have faith without works as it is to have fire without heat and light. Oh. You, you can't separate them. Mm -hmm. So if, if we are to be saved by faith through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, how, how is that faith to be judged? If faith cannot be separated from works, it makes sense that we would be judged by our works. Yeah. Well, let me add something else to this picture. Seventh-day Adventists are the only group in the world that I know of that have a certain understanding of the 2300-day-year prophecy of Daniel 8 and 9. And we have worked out the history and we believe that that 2300-year prophecy began in, in the fall of AD 50, I'm sorry, BC 457, and it takes us down to 1844 AD. And our founding fathers, before we became a, a denomination called Seventh-day Adventists, when it was still an Advent movement, believed that Jesus was going to come back at that time. Well, later we said, no, we misunderstood this, we didn't read it right. It's at that time in 1844 when the judgment is going to begin. What judgment is it that began in 1844? Is judgment still going on or is it done or? The pre-advent judgment started in 1844 as the view of the church. Okay, and, and you're not still sure going about on. that? <laughs> I think it's true. Well, what I was taught in school was that uh, that was the judgment of those who had already died. Okay, it starts with the dead. Starts with the dead. That's suggested by Ezekiel 9, where a similar judgment has taken place, yes? But the threat is that God might come to the living. Mm -hmm. At any moment, in your case. And, 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 and might come to my name while I was... Misbehaving. Misbehaving, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And that's a very uncomfortable feeling. <laughs> okay. Now, now how'd they come up with that, that answer, that explanation of what happened in 1844? I mean, why, well, why, did they, why did they have to have that boundary point or, you know, in time where it started right then and there? It's based on the understanding of the ancient Hebrew year. The 18, what happened at the beginning in 1844 was equivalent to what happened on the Day of Atonement in the ancient Hebrew year. And everybody was supposed to, you know, straighten their lives up and, and do everything right and so forth for two or three days. And then there's that very special day when the high priest goes into uh, the most holy place called the Yom Kippur, uh, the, day of, the day of the lid, if you will. And that's, that's what it's based on. So there's... So, uh, atonement was supposed to start at 1844, and I guess it didn't work. No, we're, we, we're, at, we're suggesting that it's still going on. Still going on. Mm -hmm. Now, okay. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to make a suggestion here, and this, is, this may seem strange to some of you, but hear me through. There are five different phases to the judgment that take place between beginning in 1844 and carrying all the way down until God reestablishes the new heavens and the new earth at the, after the third coming. 
The first phase of that judgment is the pre-advent judgment taking place right now, which will decide who is to be taken to heaven at the second coming and who is to be lost. Now, we believe that this is the really deciding judgment, right? The things that happen later don't really change anything. They, they, don't, they don't make, they don't, some people aren't all of a sudden, oh no, I'm sorry, it was a mistake. You were supposed to be up here and not down there, vice versa. This is the preeminent judgment. And who's involved? Well, Daniel 7, 9 and 10 suggests that the whole universe, onlooking universe, is, is, is involved because what they're deciding not, is this is not God's judgment. God could write a, print a list immediately. He knows what the answers are. But the rest of the universe is looking on, and what are they deciding? They're deciding who they believe it will be safe to live next door to for the rest of eternity. Let me say that again. The rest of the universe is looking over God's shoulder. They're looking at these books and they're saying, here's the record spread out in front of us. Which one of these people is it going to be safe to live next door to for the rest of eternity? Okay, that's the pre-advent judgment. Then the second phase is what we might call an initial executive judgment. When God actually takes, does something, he actually exercises something based on what has been decided. And that happens at the second coming of Jesus when the righteous will be either resurrected or translated and taken to heaven and the wicked who are still alive will perish along with the, the dead who are already dead. So the wicked are be, going to be left here on this earth and the righteous are going to be taken to heaven. So that, you, that was a... That, that, that point there is carrying out of the judgment, carrying out This is judgment? A, an initial phase of the carrying out of the judgment, yes. Okay. Okay. Then third, there's a millennial judgment during which the righteous will be allowed to review all the records and come to the conclusion that God's judgments were completely fair and that God did everything possible for the salvation of each person. And that's implied by the verse we read earlier in Revelation 20, verse 4, where the righteous will be sitting on thrones alongside of God. And let's see if we can expel that out a little bit. Suppose you had a cousin that you thought was a great person, you loved them, you thought they were a good Christian, and lo and behold, unbelievably, you discover that, that person is not in heaven. You're there, but he's not there. And you're going to rush to God and say, what happened? Cousin Jim or whoever he is, that guy should have been here. And God says, okay, look at the record for yourself. You decide. And there might be something on the other side of the coin yeah. saying, who let that guy in? Exactly. There's no way he's supposed to be here. Yeah, exactly. So, also, also that, that possibility. Mm -hmm. So apparently we're given up to a thousand years to make sure that we're satisfied that God's judgment was completely fair, that he did everything he possibly could to save everybody that was savable. Then a very interesting thing happens, and this is primarily spelled out in the writings of Alan White in the book Great Controversy. At the third coming, the new Jerusalem comes down to this earth. God is moving his headquarters from heaven to this earth. And when he comes down, of course, all the wicked are raised, and suddenly Satan and all his angels have something to do again. The wicked are there, and they can start working on them. And Revelation and Ellen White tell us that the, these massive hordes of people will gather together, they'll all get organized, and they will surround the city of God and prepare to attack it. When that happens, we're told, Jesus will be raised up above the city of God, and perhaps the city will be raised off the earth as well, and Jesus will be crowned, Prince of, of Heaven or whatever. At the same time, or just immediately after that, there will be a panorama that will de depict the major events of the Great Controversy and all that was involved from beginning to end. Now, what would be the purpose of all of that? Why would God need to do that? Well, this would be the ultimate judgment of God's behavior since sin began. Okay. This would be the, uh, I, the explanation of, of, of God's uh, uh, refuting Satan's charges that we saw back there in Genesis 3. Okay. That God, uh, that Satan has accused God of, of being unfair, 
uh, uh, not acting in our best interest. Of lying. Of lying, of trying to keep us subordinated. And uh, God can say, well, take a look at how I've behaved over the last 6,000 yeah. years. Well, there's three verses, or three passages in the Bible that speak specifically, I think, to this event. The first one is found in Isaiah 45, 23. And here you see it. My promise is true and it will not be changed. I solemnly promise by all that I am, this is God speaking, everyone will come and kneel before me and vow to be loyal to me. Now that's, I wouldn't say that's the best translation, but look at the New Testament version of that verse. This would be, the first, the first occurrence is, is, is Romans 14, 11. For the scripture says, as surely as I am the living Lord, the says, living God says the Lord, everyone will kneel before me and everyone will confess that I am God. Okay, everyone. Okay, Paul goes on in more detail um, in, in Philippians 2, 10 and 11. And this is the most detailed of all. And so in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below, and who does that include? The dead. All the ones who used to be dead, in this case, will fall on their knees. Would that include the devil himself? Everybody in heaven, everybody on earth, everybody under the earth, that's everybody, right? Every person who has ever lived will fall on their knees and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So how do you accomplish all of that? What is going to, at least temporarily, convince the devil that God is right? The truth. I mean, and the, that's the what's going to be shown in that great panorama. The, 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 the truth that's be, going to be shown there, the whole history of the great controversy, is so compelling that everyone, the wicked, the righteous, everybody's going to be on their knees saying, yes, God, what you did was exactly right. And this accomplishes something very interesting. For the first time, the wicked have a chance to see the whole picture, the, all the issues, and they say, now I understand why I'm out here and not in there. So that's why I call this is the fourth phase of the judgment. The wicked, before they're finally die, or even they, in other words, when even the wicked are allowed to see and make the decision that yes, God was right. He did it right and everything. And when that's over, then the final executive judgment takes place when the devil and all his followers, from the time he rebelled in heaven until the last sinner to live, have a, having agreed that God was right, will admit that they were wrong and then die the second death. And then we have one more verse that comes up, God will clean up the mess, and that's Isaiah 66, 24, where it says, as they leave, it's talking about the people who, have, who are in heaven, and, and Isaiah 65 and 66 are all about the people in heaven. Um, on every new moon festival and every Sabbath, people of every nation will come to worship me here in Jerusalem, says the Lord. As they leave, they will see the dead bodies. Notice these are not living people. These are dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will never die, and the fire that burns them will never be put out. The sight of them will be disgusting to the whole human race. Now, we have trouble with that language. I think what God is saying here is that God's glory basically will clean up the mess. And that's, those are the words from Ellen White. God's glory will clean up the mess what is destroyed at the end is not living people, not torturing people. What's destroyed at the end is dead bodies. What's left over after they die as a consequence of their sins. So, so I judgment, say there's five phases to the judgment. So judgment is basically everybody getting the correct judgment of God. Everybody of being convinced ultimately that God has done what is right. So it becomes, as you suggested, not just a judgment of us, but we in turn are, turn around and say, well, what about the, the judge, the judge himself? Has he been fair? Has he been honest? Has he been, has he treated everybody fairly? And the answer will be absolutely, even the devil will finally admit 
that God has done it right. Yeah. This is going to be a very key event because mm -hmm. this is the event where evil is put down forever. Right. And it's the situation for that has got to be something that's even we can't we can't imagine right at the yeah. moment, but it's getting there. Yeah. So. Well, now let's pick some examples from the Bible that might give us a clue about God's judgment. Genesis three. What happens in Genesis three? The story of the Garden of Eden, the fall of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Satan leads Eve astray. She eats the fruit. She takes it to Adam. He eats the fruit. They realize that they've lost their robes of light and they're uncomfortable. They feel like they're naked. They hide. God shows up. And then what happens? Genesis 3.15 says, I will make you and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head, and you will bite her offspring's heel. And he said to the woman, I will increase your trouble in pregnancy and your pain in giving birth. In spite of this, you will still have desire for your husband, yet you will be subject to him. And it goes on. Genesis 3.15 is a very interesting passage. Notice that it says, I will make you and the woman hate each other. What does that suggest? Doesn't that suggest a cosmic conflict? That's what I see. Yeah. I see the whole Bible as, as being a description of that conflict mm -hmm. uh, from beginning to end. But God says, I, I will tell you right up front, before you even realize what, what is going on here, what will be the outcome. What will be the outcome of this conflict? The enemy's head will be crushed. Right? Now, we've, we've discussed last time about well, how that might actually take place. But at least, here's a promise of what the outcome will be within, I mean, almost before, basically in God's first discussion of what sin's all about and what the consequences will be, right? Well, within a very short time after this first sin, Adam, I mean, God showed up on Adam and Eve. What were they doing? Hiding. 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 And God saying, where are you? What are you doing? Why are you hiding? Uh, did God not know where they were? But isn't that an illustration of seeking dark and mm -hmm. seeking light? Mm -hmm. They knew they were guilty. They tried to hide. Mm -hmm. Sin separating. Yeah, right exactly. There. there we see it all illustrated right in the first story, basically. Well, one of the most incredible stories, moving on, about God's judgment on wickedness is the story of the flood in Noah's day. Skeptics of the Bible have made a big deal of the fact that there are many, literally hundreds, of flood stories in primitive civilizations around the world. They would like us to believe that the Bible flood story came from one of these pagan stories, nothing more than a myth or legend. By contrast, those of us who believe in the Bible take all these stories as very strong proof that there was, in fact, sometime in the past, in the distant past, we'll admit, a worldwide flood. I mean, how else would all these different, even primitive, isolated bits of society here and there have this, these similar stories about a worldwide flood? Yes, go ahead. Could I digress a moment? Okay. The skeptics point at this story to make God out uh, as, as, as really someone to be afraid of and feared. Mm -hmm. That uh, when I ask my, not my church going friends, they just say, well, God got fed up. Lost his temper maybe. Yeah. And drowned them all. So what does the Bible say about why he sent the flood? It simply says they were so sinful. Mm -hmm. Now, there are a couple of ways of looking at that. Let's read the actual words, Genesis 6, 5. When the Lord saw how wicked everyone on earth was and how evil their thoughts were all the time, he was sorry he had, made, he had ever made them and put them on the earth. Go ahead. Okay. There's, I guess a couple of ways to look at that. Uh, you know, I ask, I ask my friends, are, 
were they more wicked than people are today? I find that hard to believe. I mean, uh, we, we have, have stooped to such degradation. Mm -hmm. How could they be more wicked than we are today? Mm -hmm. Another way to look at that is, is not how vertically they were wicked, but how broadly they were wicked. Mm -hmm. That is, everybody mm -hmm. was wicked. And <clears throat> that, that it included, that the wicked included almost everybody down to one man and his family. Mm -hmm. So what would have happened if God had not stepped in? that Noah would have died, his sons uh, didn't all turn out to be such shining moral examples, that in the long run, God would have lost all Not his even, friends. I don't think that long, maybe one generation and God would have lost complete contact with the human race. Uh, just, just a few years possibly, mm -hmm. that God would not have had anybody to communicate with and God has placed himself in the, in the, what do I say, the grandfather of all political campaigns. Mm -hmm. he, is, he is trying to win our allegiance, win our vote, and Satan has taken up the same role. He is trying to win our vote. It, it, it hardly differs from, from our political campaign. Uh, so, if God didn't have anybody to talk to. Yeah. He's but using this earth as a theater stage to teach the other two thirds that stayed around in heaven as to how evil works. First Corinthians starts out 4, with, 9. Right. Starts out with long lifespans, almost a thousand years long. Then the time of the flood you're describing there, they shortened down to about 120 years. But now those, the onlooking beings, observers can see lifespans and how evil works itself out and over and over and over repetitively for thousands of years. But the idea that God had a purpose exactly. to maintain communication, influence with this world, makes him look good. Mm -hmm. That he was willing to run the risk of being misunderstood so that he could continue working for our salvation, not just our salvation, but the security mm -hmm. of the whole universe, that that's his objective. Mm -hmm. And the preservation of the two thirds that hung around. That's yeah. right. They were still had questions, that's, and which right. carried on clear up until the time of the cross. Now, yeah. did God make provisions to save people in Noah's day? Uh, yes, he did. Mm -hmm. The door was open. Noah preached, he pleaded with people. For a couple, couple of weeks? 120 years. 120 years. 120 years. And the Bible clearly spells that out. So the flood was a rescue mission of God, not a, mm -hmm. an, an angry punishment. Mm -hmm. That's good. I like that. Yeah. It was for the preservation of his creation. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not just the creation. I mean, uh, uh, it, it's, it's the... I'm it's talking about the universe. Harmony, right the okay. harmony throughout the entire universe. Yeah. That's what it was meant to run, is in harmony. Right. Yeah. So now, as we're running out of time here, we have suggested that God's judgment is based on our deeds. He's going to look down. The whole universe is looking over his shoulder. They are trying to decide whether it's safe for us to have, to have us as future neighbors, that kind of stuff. And that decision is being made as those kinds of decisions are being made as we speak. That investigative judgment, that pre-advent judgment is taking place right now. But not even God can save sinners in their sins. If he did, what would happen? Disharmony. We well, continuation. How would, how would, the new earth wouldn't be any better than this one. Please Pretty soon we'd be right, for eternity. yeah, we'd be just right back into the same mess we're in now, right? So God says, I'm sorry, as much as he would like to save everybody, and the Bible makes that very clear, he cannot because because of our free will. He honors our freedom. He says, if you choose to go the other direction, I mean, I will cajole, I will plead, I will send you messengers, I will send you prophets, I will give you the Bible. But when it's all done and said, 
If you determine to go the other way, there, I, I'm not going to violate your freedom. So, we've already said very clearly that we're all sinners. No question about that. If you want, have questions about it, read Romans 1 to 3. Um, and based on that, based on if the strict justice idea, we all deserve to die, right? Well, as a result of that apparent conundrum, Christian theologians have worked out a complicated system of, and there's lots of words here, justification and sanctification and perfection and salvation and forgiveness and pardon and redemption and the names go on, the, the ideas go on and on. How are all these things related to what we read back there in John 3, coming to the light? I mean, coming to the light sounds so simple, right? Somehow it seems to me that it's as we look at Jesus and we like what we see, we go towards him. We mm -hmm. want to become like him. Uh, we want to live like him um, rather than following in the evil ways of, of, of those around us. Okay. It's not natural for us because even Paul said, the things I don't want to do, I do. Mm -hmm. John, that's in Romans 7, very clearly. Well, think about this for a minute. Both grace and condemnation imply judgment, don't they? You get condemned because you've been judged, right? You can experience God's graciousness because you, you, you have been judged, but you have taken you know, you have made, or taken advantage of the provisions that God has made, and now grace is extended to you and you're saved. So, both on both sides of the coin, it's clearly suggested that there will be judgment. We're not going to save ourselves. There's no way we can come back on our own. God does this, and we have to take advantage. If we're going to be saved, we have to take advantage of the provisions He has made. Our adult, Bible study, our adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide says, without grace, we'd all be consumed by God's justice. Our only hope then, standing before a just God, is grace. Is it not really God's justice that would, it is not really God's justice that would consume us, but what? Our sin. It's sin that's deadly. It's not, and here, let's be very clear. It's not God standing up there with a big stick trying to figure out who we should zap. God is trying to save all of his children. But he says, some of you, I cannot get you to leave your sins behind. And if you're going to cling to those sins, there's nothing I can do except allow you to be destroyed by those sins. God offers a way out, but that way out includes being separated from our sins. There's a famous verse that Seventh-day Adventists have made a great deal out of. It's found in Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. So, first of all, there's a what being offered? An eternal message. An eternal message of what? Good news. So, after having heard the eternal message of good news, everyone on the earth, what's going to happen? He then said in a loud voice, Honor God and praise His greatness, for the time has come for Him to judge. Worship Him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. So, what should be our response? When we hear this good news being offered, do we hang on to our sins or do we run from our sins? Well, you can't approach God with your sins. So mm -hmm. I guess when you leave your sins, that's the same thing as saying that you're coming towards mm -hmm. God. In the more traditional translations, these verses say, fear God and give glory to Him. Why, why do they say fear God? To respect Him. Respect Him. But to that's different than God, fear, isn't it? To be in awe of God, is that a good To be in awe of God. Okay. Well, they use the word of scared. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the... When we look at, when, when we experience God's 
eternal message of good news, do we respond with thankfulness or fearfulness? Thankfulness, gratitude. Once again, our adult Sabbath school Bible study guide says, without grace, what message would we have for the world other than that is God is going to destroy us all and there's no hope of escape? Fortunately, the message we have has the everlasting gospel as its foundation. Once again, we need to take note that it is not God's justice that is destroying the wicked, it is their sin. We have drunk the poison and we need healing. For a much deeper understanding of God's judgment, read the chapters Joshua and the Angel, Prophets and Kings, page 582 to 592, and Facing Life's Record, which used to be called the Investigative Judgment, or the pre-advent judgment in Great Controversies 479 to 491. And notice particularly this passage. Jesus does not excuse their sins, but shows their penitence and faith and claiming for them forgiveness. These are, these are his followers now. He lifts his wounded hands before the Father and the holy angels saying, so who's looking on? Jesus lifts his hands before who? Father, the Father, Father and, the and the Holy Angel, saying, I know them by name, I have graven them on my, the palms of my hands. Great Controversy 484. So Jesus is making his appeal to our future neighbors and friends. He shows our repentance and faith and claims our forgiveness. We have already noticed in Daniel 7, 9 and 10 that the entire universe is very much interested in how this all is going to come out. So in the setting of the Great Controversy, we must recognize that sin happened in heaven long before it did here on this earth. The Revelation 12, 13, Ephesians 1, Matthew 25, just for some examples. These verses make it abundantly clear that God's plan of salvation was in place long before Adam and Eve sinned. Sin didn't catch God by surprise. God can never win the great controversy by threatening people. If it was possible to scare the hell out of people, he would have done it long ago. Consider what happened right after the flood. People living with the full knowledge of what happened built a tower in defiance of God. So how are people responding to the idea of God's judgment in our day? And maybe more personally we need to ask, how are we reacting to the idea of God's judgment? I hope you've got some more things to think about. See you next week.